Thank you, Clem, and thank you, Greg. What a pleasure it is to be here. I love Chautauqua Institution. Now, Greg asked me and swore me really to, to confine my remarks to the modern Supreme Court. And I do intend to talk about the Supreme Court today uh, at the very end, uh, and briefly. <laughs> and to frame my conclusion, what I'd like to do is begin with the story of a very old uh, and remarkable case. And it was a well-known piece of litigation in its time, but as far as I can tell today, it is generally obscure, save to specialists in presidential power. And I think that is really quite unfortunate. So let me tell you about this case. The case is called In Re Nagel. In Re Nagel. And it involves two chief justices of the California Supreme Court who served in successive terms. The first was a man named David S. Terry, born in Kentucky in 1823, to a family of Scotch-Irish descent. His parents moved to Texas in 1835, and unfortunately, they both soon died, leaving their 13-year-old boy, as he put it, to my own guardianship. Terry made use of his freedom the way we imagine a 13-year-old might, and he found his way later that same year into the Texas War of Independence, where he fought under Sam Houston. He grew into a massive man, standing six foot three, with what one contemporary called Atlantean shoulders and sinews. At age 27, David Terry traveled California, engaged in some Indian fighting, mined for gold in Calaveras County. It was a free time in the West, and men like Terry could move between occupations and roles and classes in a way that seems totally unimaginable to us now. One year later, Terry ran for mayor of Stockton and narrowly lost. He decided to open up a law practice, and in late 1855, at the age of 33, five years after arriving in California, he was elected to the state Supreme Court. Terry's opinions have been described as terse, logical, and generally sound, which I think was meant as praise. <laughs> but one senses that the law didn't leave too deep an impression on the man. During Terry's first year in judicial office, he stabbed someone in the neck during an armed standoff. Two years later, he became involved with a public dispute, in a public dispute rather, with David Broderick, United States Senator from California. Terry resigned his judgeship, challenged the senator to a duel, and shot him dead. Soon after, he left California for Texas to fight with the Confederate Army in the Civil War. The second of our chief justices in this story is much better known, although not for vividness of biography. It really would be hard to top Terry. This man is Stephen Field, who later became Chief Justice of the California Supreme Court upon Terry's resignation in 1859, and two years after that was elevated to the United States Supreme Court by President Lincoln. Field was born in 1816 into a sophisticated New England family. He attended Williams College and went into practice with New York, in New York City uh, with his brother, the famous David Dudley Field, Jr., who is known to New York lawyers as the author of the Field Code, Code of Civil Procedure. In 1848, Stephen, too, traveled to California to make his fortune in the gold rush. He called in a debt owed to his brother, and he used the money to speculate in land. And for a time, he had success, and he found himself soon in the state's legislature. It is perhaps telling of the difference between Field and Terry, though, that when Field was challenged to a duel, we are, we are told that no shots were exchanged for various reasons. The result was likely fortuitous, as Field later professed never to carry a firearm. He was appointed to the California Supreme Court in 1857, where he served with David Terry for two years. Now, the Nagel case arose out of a real bizarre series of events that unfolded when David Terry returned to California after the Civil War. Terry married a woman named Sarah Hill, who claimed a right by an earlier marriage to half the assets of a deceased Nevada silver baron. Oddly enough, Supreme Court Justice Field presided over litigation 
contesting the validity of the marriage contract in his role as what was called a federal circuit judge at the time. At one point during these proceedings, David Terry, the former California Supreme Court <coughs> Justice, became so irate at what Field was saying that he punched the federal marshal so hard that he broke one of his teeth. And then he pulled a nine-inch bowie knife from his jacket as the deputy marshals attempted to remove him from the courtroom. For this, he was found in contempt of court, but David Terry was not cowed. And as soon as he was released from jail, he began to threaten Justice Field. He would horsewhip Field, he announced. And if the justice resented his treatment, he would kill him. Newspapers covered the story endlessly. Now, back in Washington, D.C., the United States Attorney General was reading this, and he had some concern for Field's safety. So he wrote to the federal marshal in San Francisco and asked that to protect Field while he traveled between courthouses on the West Coast, that the marshal employ what he called certain special deputies as bodyguards. The marshal appointed an amp, a man named David Nagel, a small and wiry man who had been chief of police in Tombstone, Arizona. In the next session of the circuit court, Nagel was in constant attendance on Justice Field, traveling with him between courthouses by train. Eventually, of course, David Terry found his way onto one of these trains, and while Field and Nagel were eating breakfast in a dining car, Terry approached them and slapped Justice Field in the face. Nagel stood up. He shouted, stop, stop. Terry slapped Field again. Nagel drew his revolver, shot him twice, and he died. Terry had no firearm on him. Nagel was arrested. He was charged with murder by the state of California. When he was in custody, he petitioned for a writ of habeas corpus, asserting that he should be discharged from state custody because he had acted, as the federal habeas statute stated, quote, in pursuance of a law of the United States. The problem was, there was no law, no statute, authorizing federal marshals to act as bodyguards to federal judges outside the court. There was only a letter letter from the United States Attorney General directing the marshal at San Francisco to appoint a special deputy to protect Field. Did a letter exempt a man from a state's criminal law? The Supreme Court did affirm the discharge of Deputy Nagel, but remarkably there was a dissent. Two justices, Justice Lamar and Chief Justice Fuller, would have recommitted the federal deputy to the custody of the sheriff. Why? At its core, the dispute between the majority and the dissent in Nagel was about how the government protects itself and us. It was a dispute about what I think of as the proper form of acts to protect and secure. One form is law. We are a government of laws, just as Marshall reminded us in Marbury. And a government of laws protects itself and its citizens by passing laws. To that end, many of the legislative powers vested in Congress by the Constitution are relevant to security. Yet law never covers every contingency. There are always gaps. There are always unaccounted for cases. There are rapid developments. And these eventualities require the exercise of discretion in the sense of open choice. So we are a government of laws then, but we are also necessarily always a government of discretion. And discretion is the second form of security. The Constitution, along with ordinary federal law, provides for the election and appointment of officers and their removal to exercise such a discretion. The majority and the dissent in the naval case cleaved around just this distinction between law and discretion. So writing for the majority, Justice Miller pointed to the Take Care Clause in Article II which states that, quote, the president shall take care that the law be faithfully executed. Miller reasoned that that clause obligated the president to protect judges in the federal courts because Congress had established those courts by law. In the words of Columbia University professor Henry Monaghan, 
the take care clause implied a protective power in the president. The president had discharged his obligation through the attorney general by appointing a judicial bodyguard. Therefore, Deputy Nagel, the man appointed, had acted in pursuance of the law of the United States as the habeas statute required. That law was the Constitution. Writing for the dissent, Justice Lamar pointed to the necessary and proper clause of Article I, which vested in Congress a power to make laws necessary and proper not only for the exercise of its other enumerated powers, but for the exercise of the President's powers as well, including his duties under the Take Care Clause. Thus, even if the President was obligated to keep the peace, the means by which he did so said the justice, quote, must proceed primarily from Congress. Congress had to provide for judicial bodyguards by passing a statute. And if it didn't pass a statute, if it let its power lie dormant, the president had no discretion just to act anyway. The authority to create such an office, to specify its powers and immunities, had to come from law, probably because of the effect it had on state authority. Marking this boundary between law and discretion in matters of security is the work of what I call the security court. The security court is a certain vision of the institutional role of the federal courts that puts the United States Supreme Court at the center of a collective de deliberation about the form of domestic and national security. The questions guiding the work of the security court are these. When must security be attained by law? When may it be accomplished by discretion? And how, if at all, should that discretion be bounded? In short, how much leeway does the government require to ensure our security? This concern with the form of governmental action is not unlike a number of familiar judicial doctrines concerned with procedure. These include, what you might know, procedural due process, as well as what's called the arbitrary and capricious standard from administrative law, which requires that an administrative agency examine all the relevant data and explain its action by reference to that data, rather than just tweeting out policies. In each case, courts are vindicating what we call rule of law values, such as liberty, certainty, predictability, and ultimately autonomy, or self-government. The aim of the security court is to preserve these values while ensuring that government also remains workable and strong enough to answer threats. The value placed on law explains why the court generally requires that the president conform his discretion to statutory constraints, even in emergencies, and even when those constraints are implied by the law rather than explicit. On the other hand, the court has recognized that the president has a discretion to act when he judges it necessary to fulfill a duty attached to his office and sometimes even contrary to law. The case for this power rests on the benefits of discretionary decision making. Okay, so the remainder of my comments today are gonna to have three parts. First, in part one, what I wanna do is give you several other examples, really an overview of the Supreme Court in its role as the security court. After that, in part two, I'm going to describe some instances in which the court shrunk from this role and the reasons why. And then finally, at the end, as I promised, I'm going to imagine how the addition of Mr. Justice Gorsuch might affect the security court going forward. All right? Okay, so part one, the security court in action. Now, the Supreme Court, as you probably know, is described in Article Three of the United States Constitution. That court that the Article III creates is a, quote, constitutional court in the sense that it is created by the Constitution itself as one of the three great departments of the national government, in contrast <coughs> to the inferior federal courts or the executive agencies, which are created by congressional legislation. At the time the Constitution was drafted, state courts also were largely legislative in origin. The Supreme Court created by Article III is supreme in the sense that it stands atop a jurisdictional pyramid. It is the highest ranking court of appeal in the United States, and it can accept appeals in a variety of different kinds of cases. The court's appellate jurisdiction combines law, equity, and admiralty, jurisdictions that in most states at the time 
were vested in separate bodies. State court systems in the 1780s were not pyramids, the way our federal system is, but they took the form of parallel lines, or webs. Thus, although not all cases were appealable to the Supreme Court, no case could be appealed to a different high court. And this was by design. As best we can tell, there was a consensus among delegates at the Philadelphia Convention on the need for a single national appellate court. Why? Why was the broad agreement on a need for a single national appellate court? Well, for one thing, and probably most importantly, because it was vital for security. Probably the most important difference between the Constitution and its predecessor, the Articles of Confederation, was the addition of a power of taxation in the national legislature, right? We know, all know about this. And it's a familiar point that under the Articles, the Confederation Congress could raise money only by requisitioning a portion of state tax receipts. Since the states during the war were broke, and Congress lacked a means to enforce its requisitions, states rarely paid them. Congress was forced to finance the Revolutionary War by, way, by what economists call currency finance, and what the rest was called printing money. At one point, disgruntled officers who had been promised a pension gathered in Newburgh, New York, which is north of where West Point is now. And there was talk that they might march on Philadelphia and stage a military coup. Washington showed up and persuaded them to disperse. But what this shows is that revenue and the payment of pensions were vital security issues. And a Supreme Court with appellate jurisdiction over cases arising under the national, national revenue laws could ensure that taxes were paid and collected. In this respect, state courts were undependable. Now, when legal scholars focus on the early involvement of the Supreme Court in foreign affairs, they're usually concerned with the degree to which the court was understood to have a place in formulating foreign policy, particularly by applying principles of customary international law. And this is a disputed question. Yet there's relatively little dispute that the court was understood originally to have a role in the enforcement of foreign policy determined by the other branches. Thus, for example, if treaties made by the president with the approval of the Senate were to be effective, the Supreme Court had to have jurisdiction to enforce them were those treaties to become an issue in a case. It should come as no surprise then that the statute establishing the federal courts, the Judiciary Act of 1789, one of the first great legislative accomplishments of Congress, granted the Supreme Court jurisdiction over cases arising under treaties, as well as suits brought by foreign subjects and citizens. The court's early docket reflected this design. One in four cases heard in the Supreme Court under John Jay and John Marshall involved foreign affairs, one in four. A significant portion of those cases were litigations over enforcement of trade embargoes enacted by Congress, and peace treaties made by the President and the Senate. And in these areas, noted a recent student commentator, quote, most recognized that the court would help Congress and the President hold states to their federal commitments. Since our peace with other nations depended upon upholding our treaty obligations, despite the objections of states, the court's role in enforcing those obligations was essential to national security. But what was this new court to do when different branches of the government could not agree on a foreign policy? Early presidents sought to play a large role in the determination of foreign policy, and on occasion, they exceeded or contradicted federal law. The Supreme Court did not shy from these cases. As Harold Coe observes, dean of the Yale Law School and legal advisor to the Department of State, he said, quote, perhaps the most striking feature of the period is the extent to which courts actively participated in the delineation and delimitation of the executive's authority in foreign affairs. So, for example, in the case of Little versus Berlin, Little versus Berlin, the Supreme Court held that written instructions from the Secretary of the Navy to a ship's captain to seize certain vessels on suspicion of violating a federal trade embargo did not insulate that captain from liability for exceeding the actual terms of the statute. Congress had forbidden ships to travel to French ports, 
The Secretary of the Navy had told the captain to seize ships coming from French ports. The court said the president didn't necessarily lack any authority to order such seizures. The president's high duty, observed Chief Justice Marshall, is to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. And to that end, as commander-in-chief of the Navy, he might employ American naval vessels to seize ships, violating the embargo without any authority for that purpose. Yet here, Congress had not only enacted an embargo, said Marshall, but, quote, prescribe the manner in which the law shall be carried into execution, thereby limiting the discretion of the president, the discretion he normally enjoyed, to decide on how best to execute the law. Congress supplanted his discretion with the law, and the Supreme Court vindicated its authority to do so. And this was important, because a general rule, a general law, limited the terms of military engagement with the French. Acting as a security court, however, did not mean the court would sign uniformly with Congress. Even in domestic matters, it might protect presidential discretion, just as it did in the case I began with, the Nagel case. Several decades before Nagel, Justice Miller, the author of the Nagel opinion, had joined the court's opinion in a famous litigation known as the Prize Cases, which laid out the case for the necessity of presidential discretion in addressing the Southern, quote, insurrection that became the Civil War. The question before the court was the legality of a blockade on the port of Richmond, Virginia, ordered by President Lincoln. A blockade being a military measure that was lawful only under customary laws of war. Congress, however, had not declared war. And probably it couldn't declare war on state. Nevertheless, reason Justice Greer in the opinion, the Constitution obligated the president to see federal law executed, and this implied a discretion in his office to decide on what measures were appropriate where an insurrection interfered with execution of the law. Only the president could decide if war measures, like a blockade, were necessary to meet the military objective. As Greer quipped, he must determine what degree of force the crisis demands. In Justice Greer's vision, then, the president's authority to employ a blockade was implied by his obligation to enforce the law and his military command of the armed forces. It was a matter, in short, of military necessity, and judgments of military necessity were committed to the president's discretion. Now, as the risks of foreign policy grew in the 20th century, a concern also grew about the court's involvement in these kinds of cases. In the eras of Total War and World War, stakes suddenly seemed much higher. The danger and complexity of the post-World War II period in particular triggered structural changes across the government. And the foreign policy apparatus of our national government was reconfigured around a goal of containing communism, primarily by positioning military assets abroad. Around the same time, a little bit earlier, the Supreme Court began noticeably to retreat from its jurisdiction in foreign policy cases, and even on occasion from this role I've been describing and calling the role of the security court. We'll come in just a bit to the Curtis Wright case, which is the greatest extent of retreat. But before we get there, I want to consider the famous case of Youngstown versus Sawyer. And the role the Supreme Court asserted for itself in that case in the midst of a national emergency during wartime. Youngstown, as you may know, arose out of President Truman's seizure of the nation's, many of the nation's, steel mills during the Korean War in order to prevent a labor strike. He seized the mills by executive order. And he informed Congress what he had did, and Congress remained silent. Five years earlier, though, Congress had passed a law known as the Taft-Hartley Act of 1947, which provided for mediation in cases of labor dispute and preserved the union's right to strike. Congress had expressly rejected a presidential power to seize and operate industrial plants. In light of the statute and the fact that the steel mills were domestic and not in the conventional theater of battle, the Supreme Court held that President Truman lacked constitutional authority to seize them. Writing for the court, Justice Black described the president's order as lawmaking. Now, it wasn't lawmaking merely because it was the president's policy. Black would not have denied that the president could make policy in exercising his discretion 
deciding how best to execute the law. It was lawmaking because President Truman's order operated to repeal the law, this Taft-Hartley Act of 1947, and to replace it with a policy he had decided on. There was no inherent discretionary emergency power that the president had to repeal law. Only law could undo law. Thus, the court clearly rejected the view advanced by the government in the court below that the president had inherent power, and this is the language of the government's attorney, to take such action as is necessary to meet the emergency. A power that the attorney traced in general to Article 2 of the Constitution, though he said he did not want to get into a discussion of semantics. Just, Justice Jackson's concurrence, which has proven to be the most influential of the opinions in Youngstown, makes much the same point. Jackson famously identifies three categories of presidential power. This is the structure lawyers use, incidentally, to analyze almost all conflicts between the executive branch and Congress. So the three categories are, first, when the president acts consistently with the will of Congress, second, when Congress is silent, and third, when the president acts inconsistently with the will of Congress. President Truman's order, because of the Taft-Hartley Taft Act, fell into category three. It was inconsistent with the will of Congress, and thus, reason Jackson, the court must apply the greatest scrutiny to the act. The rubric, rubric is helpful. It's a great lawyerly device, but its significance, I think, is often missed, at least in part. It's important not simply because it checks executive unilateralism and preserves an equilibrium between the branches. Rather, as Jeff Powell put it, who's formerly a senior attorney in the Office of Legal Counsel, which advises the executive branch, the key idea is that legislative powers have legal priority so that the existence of executive authority is dependent on what Congress has done. In other words, in an effort to mark a boundary between law and discretion, this role of the security court, discretion generally retreats when the law advances. Law colonizes discretion, to shift the metaphor. This dynamic is characteristic of what Jackson called free government or government, quote, by those impersonal forces we call law. Men have discovered no technique for long preserving free government, he writes in conclusion, except that the executive be under law, and the law be made by parliamentary deliberation. Okay, so that's part one, security court in action. I'm going to turn now to part two, which I'm going to title Insecurity about the security court. <coughs> The Supreme Court has not always been a security court in the sense that I've described it. At times it's tried to be more, and at times it's been something less. And before we speculate about how the modern, the contemporary court, might handle security cases in the next few terms, I want to consider why it's retreated when it has retreated. Earlier I mentioned a distinction between formulating foreign policy and enforcing a policy determined by the other branches. And there are reasons to doubt that an institution like the United States Supreme Court should have a hand in formulating our foreign policy, given who its staff are and the institutional limits of the court. Yet, in a very basic way, when the court limits or refuses to limit the scope of the president's discretion, it is making policy. Let me give you an example. Suppose the president announces that he is withdrawing our nation from a treaty, but that in litigation arising under that treaty, the Supreme Court enforces it, despite the President's announcement on grounds that the President had no such authority. Isn't the court making foreign policy? Isn't the court deciding, at least in the case before it, that we should have the policy of that treaty? At times, the presence of very complex, high-stakes policy questions has led Supreme Court justices to express discomfort, even with exercising jurisdiction at all. Consider the well-known case of Korematsu versus the United States. This is the case where the court upheld what were known as exclusion orders issued by Army General John DeWitt, who acted on the authority of the, uh, <coughs> President Roosevelt resulting in the forced removal of over 100,000 men, women, and children of Japanese descent from the West Coast. The orders had rested on FDR's authority as commander-in-chief, although Congress later criminalized disobeying them. Justice Jackson dissented from the court's decision upholding the order, but on grounds that military orders were not subject to constitutional structure at all. 
The aim of military measures, Jackson wrote, was to be successful rather than legal. A constitutional test requiring that military orders be reasonable, which is what the majority had said, was impossible to apply, Jackson said, since judges had no capacity to determine whether military orders were reasonable. In effect, upholding the general's exercise of discretion as reasonable would mean giving his policy, his exclusion orders, a constitutional sanction. According to Jackson, the court should do no such thing, and he would dismiss the case. Now, pushed to its limit, these kinds of concerns about policymaking and judicial expertise have led the Supreme Court not only to carve out dramatically larger spheres for executive discretion, but to swear off any involvement in foreign policy themselves. This is how I read the famous case of the United States versus Curtis Wright export, in which the court held that a presidential power based on federal law to criminalize the sale of weapons to Bolivia was constitutional. Congress had authorized the president to ban such sales by proclamation if he concluded that an influx of weapons into the area would inflame an armed conflict there. Justice Sutherland, writing for the court, held that foreign affairs power was an aspect of the inherent sovereignty of the national government. It did not flow from any specific grant in the Constitution. And among the branches of the government, Sutherland reasoned, the president alone was capable of handling the complex, sensitive issues that arose in representing the nation abroad. One wonders what he would have said about Twitter. <laughs> Thus, the president's office necessarily enjoyed, this is, uh, sorry, necessarily enjoyed, and this is Sutherland's language, a very delicate, plenary, and exclusive power, exclusive power, as the sole organ of the federal government in the field of international relations. The nature of foreign affairs implied further that the court should not be in haste to apply, he said, constitutional rules that had originated in the context of domestic affairs where the court had a substantial role to play. Sutherland, who is the leading architect of this vision, thus pushed federal courts to accept what one leading historian has called a sharply reduced role as overseers of executive foreign policy decisions. Now, the contemporary Supreme Court has rejected the more extreme statements of Justice Sutherland and Curtis Wright, calling them dicta, but there remains considerable sympathy for the worry about judicial policymaking and foreign affairs that's behind a lot of this. There's a related worry, too, which I want to just mention before I go on to the last part of the talk, which is whether there are proper judicial methods for marking a boundary between law and discretion, given the policy implications of that kind of decision. Now, in these cases, usually the court is going to look at what are relatively familiar lawyerly sources of constitutional interpretation, and it focuses in particular on history, what we call the structure of the Constitution and judicial precedent. But the pressure to craft a rule that is both workable for government and legally limited oftentimes pushes the court into the sphere of the other branches. Probably the best example is the recent case of Hamdi versus Rumsfeld, where a plurality of justices employed an interest balancing test from the procedural due process case of Matthews v. Eldridge to determine what additional process enemy combatants should be provided in hearings to contest their status. Justice Scalia, writing in dissent, could not abide it. He fumed about what he called the court's Mr. Fix-It mentality, <laughs> which he found plainly legislative. Okay, so that's the end of part two, the worries about this role of the security court. Part three is the security court in transition. Okay, so the Supreme Court is at a point of transition. Right? We've just gained a new member, Mr. Justice Gorsuch. And in all likelihood, we're going to gain another member in the next few terms. So will this new Supreme Court be a security court, as I've described that idea? And how will it handle legal challenges to President Trump's entry ban order? <coughs> now, I'm a historian at heart. I'm not a court watcher, really. But in closing, let me just say how I think about these issues and what I'm going to be looking for as the next term in particular unfolds.
Now, first question, do we have a security court just before Mr. Justice Gorsuch was appointed? I think we did. Now, unlike the early history of our country today, the court does not hear many cases involving foreign policy, national security, and executive power. But when it does, it clearly evidences a concern with what I've called the form of governmental action, whether it's by law or discretion. The case of Zivotofsky versus Kerry, decided two terms ago, involved a dispute between Congress and the President over the status of Jerusalem as part of Israel. In the 2003 Foreign Relations Authorization Act, Congress permitted applicants for passports to list Jerusalem, Israel as their place of birth. But the President instructed the Secretary of State to delete Israel and just write Jerusalem because the President was attempting to broker a peace deal between one party who found it very offensive to identify Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. The question before the Supreme Court was whether the Secretary of State should be required to follow federal law, which required the printing of Israel, rather than presidential instruction. The opinion written by Justice Kennedy describes the question as a matter of separation of powers. But here, as in many other cases, it's impossible to ask, really, to look at the Constitution and determine where it allocates this power. Because look at it as much as you want. There is no passport printing power. I can tell you, I've read it quite a few times. So as Kennedy approached this, the, con the question was really which branch should have the power to recognize foreign governments. And the answer to that was the president. And why? Well, because the president could act on his own, quickly and decisively, which is very important in foreign affairs. All features of decision making by discretion rather than deliberation of law. Thus, the court vindicated the president's discretion to act even contrary to federal law. All right, so second question. Assuming we had a security court right before Gorsuch's appointment, will be one now that he's on the court? Well, we don't know. Gorsuch was confirmed by the Senate just in April, in time for the last sitting of the Supreme Court's 2016 term, which is the April sitting. And none of the cases in this setting uh, really, in the sitting, really were cases of national security, although one or two came close. We do have a sense, however, of how Gorsuch might vote in the case involving President Trump's entry ban, which is now scheduled uh, to be heard before the court just in the second week of this coming October. In late June, just about a month ago, the court, as you probably know, granted cert in that case, and it partially stayed which means lifted the lower court orders, the injunctions that had suspended the entry ban. The effect of the court's order was to permit applications for entry only from individuals who had what it called a bona fide relationship with a person or organization within the United States. And now this is a question of does that include grandparents or not, right? Okay. Justice Gorsuch agreed with granting cert, but he joined a concurring opinion written by Justice Clarence Thomas, which expressed the view that the court's stay of the lower court injunctions should have been total. In effect, reinstating President Trump's ban in its entirety. Of course, it's joined this concurrence. Now, the Supreme Court stays a lower court order when there is a strong chance it's going to reverse them. Uh, a commentary of Josh Blackman has looked at this and he found that in, under the Roberts Court, in 22 of 24 cases where the court granted a stay and cert, as it did in this case, the court has overturned the lower courts. Okay? And the lower courts suspended the ban. So I think it's likely, and if I were a betting man, I would bet for it, that Justice Gorsuch will vote to reverse the orders of the Ninth and Fourth Circuits, which suspended the entry ban, assuming that the court retains jurisdiction of the case, which for complex reasons it might not. Now, this is disappointing to some, but it's not a change in the court, because Justice Scalia surely <coughs> also would have voted that way. To project further forward, beyond the entry ban case, we have to look at Justice Gorsuch's body of work as a Federal Circuit judge. 
And I agree with some other academics who have suggested that Judge Gorsuch's opinions on the administrative state are of particular interest. And this is a bit pointy-headed, but let me just let me bring your attention to it for a moment because I think it's helpful. Several of the opinions that Judge Gorsuch wrote differed from Justice Scalia in his attitude about decision-making and lawmaking in the executive branch. Scalia came of age when the prospects for conservative policy change focused on the presidency. They didn't have Congress, they had the presidency. And he was part of a broad intellectual movement to facilitate that policy change by rediscovering in the presidency grand authorities, like an authority to independently interpret the Constitution and to supervise and even direct the entirety of the administrative state. Related to this movement were efforts to insulate the legal decisions of administrative agencies under the president's control from judicial review. Thus, we have a doctrine known as Chevron deference, whose essence is that federal courts should defer to agencies on the meaning of federal law, unless the agency is totally wrong. Gorsuch, in contrast to Scalia, did not come of an age in a period in which conservatism focused on the presidency and the administration. And as a circuit judge, he did not share Scalia's desire for judges to defer to the executive and to defer to administrative agencies. Thus, there's this case, Gutierrez Brizuela versus Lynch, where the issue was whether Chevron deference applied retroactively. Let's skip the details. Justice, Judge Gorsuch, rather interestingly, wrote that deference to the executive, here's his language, permits executive bureaucracies to swallow huge amounts of core judicial and legislative power and concentrate federal power in a way that seems more than a little difficult to square with the constitution of the framers' design. Maybe the time has come, he wrote, to face the behemoth. If Justice Gorsuch shares the views of Judge Gorsuch, then I think we should expect skepticism from him towards claims of deference to the executive and uh, from efforts by bureaucracies to use their discretion to concentrate lawmaking power and law executing power. For similar reasons, I think we should expect him to be skeptical towards congressional efforts to defer excessive discretion to the president, which is exactly, by the way, the structure of federal immigration law that allows for the entry ban. Both kinds of skepticisms align with the values and aims of the security court. On the other hand, Justice Gorsuch may be unwilling to extend these skepticisms into the national security context, and I think his decision to sign Justice Thomas's concurrence in the entry ban order suggests a such a limit. So there's much talk of Gorsuch as the second coming of Justice Scalia, but at this point it's just talk. We do not know the justice that Mr. Justice, that Mr. Gorsuch will become, or the effect he will have on the court. We do know he likes to write his own opinions, and he shares Scalia's love for a clever turn of phrase. But his pen shades into the dramatic, not unlike Justice Kennedy, for whom Gorsuch clerked. And Kennedy's dramatic diction bothered Scalia to no end. Scalia could not abide what he thought were Kennedy's grandiloquent gestures, but as I see them, they were just part of Kennedy's vision for the court as the guardian of the Constitution and the rule of law. At the same time, Kennedy believed, as he wrote in Zivotofsky, that there is a core of presidential power Congress may not regulate. Gorsuch may share both these views with Kennedy. And if they are the ones that flower in the years to come, we may see a second Justice Kennedy rather than a second Justice Scalia. And that would preserve a place for the security court. Thank you.